<laughs> and everyone I leaves. You, his, the talk is sweeter. <laughs> or colder. Uh, yeah, something. <laughs> All right, so um, before the uh, introduction, a, a, a quick announcement that the next um, the department conference speaker will be Christina Wolofsky at Middlebury College. And her talk is going to be about volatile recycling in heterogeneous mantle. And then she was also going to talk about some hydrology in ocean island basalts. Okay. Okay. So today, uh, I'm very glad to introduce um, Noah Randolph-Flag, uh, who is at NASA Ames currently. So Noah is also a pretty good friend of mine since uh, during graduate school. Uh, so Noah uh, grew up actually in Kauai, in Hawaii. So by default, he's a volcanologist. Right? <laughs> so, um, so he grew up in, in Hawaii, and then he went to Carlton College uh, for his undergrad. He was uh, <laughs> in Minnesota. So, <laughs> yeah, I know there are some people from Carlton, right? Um, and then we just realized that uh, he's a uh, dual morph teacher was classmate of uh, Karen. <laughs> so there's a lot of connection here. Okay, so um, after that, he went to graduate school at UC Berkeley uh, a few years ago. So that's where, when we um, knew each other, I was a bit senior than him. My first impression is that this, this kid always wants to speak Chinese to me. <laughs> in fact, he actually speaks really good Chinese. He spent one year in China doing um, some experiments in hydrology. So overall, NOAA is very interested in something that is dynamics. So something like stress perturbation, how that stress is going to interact with fluid, and how is that going to change fluid pressure, how it's going to change your hydrology cycle, and then how temperature variation from bottom to the top is going to influence something like volcanic, like get ash, ash, um, ash, um, convection and all that kind of questions. So he has been you know, going out to the field, trying to measure distance between columns. So those are um, um, some um, volcano deposits and then run, run some model to explain those dynamic systems and figure out the landscape. So those are pretty much the, uh, the question he is interested in. At Berkeley, he worked with uh, Michael Menga. So, he's, so, so, so those are um, some dealing with questions in hydrology and volcanoes. Uh, maybe partly because he's interested in learning Chinese, so he spent, he spent two years, uh, two summers in Taiwan, working in Academia Sinica in Taipei. Uh, luckily, I was in Taiwan for one of the summers, and I just went back home, and then we ended up doing a lot of field work together. We, uh, uh, we went to hunt a lot of mud volcanoes. It was, during one, uh, during one field work, I got a phone call from some, someone and said, well, there's just a new vo volcano eruption going on in someone's rice field. And then we drove for two hours so to go there and then see the mud volcano, see the eruption, and see something's on fire. It's quite scary, actually. <laughs> yeah. So Noah finished his PhD um, earlier this year, and he's now a, a NASA postdoc fellow. So today, he's going to tell us about um, earthquakes and waters and why that matters. Ms. Wilkham. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Meng Han, so much for that kind introduction. And I've, I've had a really stimulating and, and fun day. So thank you all for being here and for turning down ice cream to be here. So th this is a photo from the plate boundary. Between, on the left, you see the Philippine Sea plate. On the right, you see the Eurasian plate. And this plate is moving up. So the left side is moving up relative to the right side, and it moves seasonally. And so what I'm going to be talking about is earthquakes from a really hydrologic perspective on how, how we can understand motion on faults um, uh, related to, to the hydrologic system. And of course, earthquakes are of, of uh, immense, produce a lot of damage, and ha we are interest we're interested in the damage and the dynamics of these earthquakes and the processes that generate these earthquakes. Um, and this is, of course, of local interest because of the, the earthquakes here, um, which also produced a lot of damage. So this is a map showing where the earthquake in 2011 in Virginia was felt versus a, a comparably sized earthquake in California. Um, so I thought maybe it would be useful to start with a little historical perspective on, on earthquake science. And 
Uh, this, is the, the, this is a map on the left of California. Um, and you can see the Central Valley and the San Andreas Fault moving north-south. And this is a, a photo of the uh, San Andreas Fault near Parkfield. And in the, in the 70s and 80s, people thought that this would be an ideal setting to understand earthquake, um, the, the processes that produce earthquakes. The reason for that you can see here on the x-axis is time. Um, and on the y-axis, showing each of these earthquakes. And these earthquakes ended up being roughly evenly spaced in time. And they ended up being almost identical at this setting. And so here, uh, I'm showing seismograms. It doesn't really matter the exact um, details of these wiggly lines. But the point is that multiple of these wiggly lines look so identical that people said, well, if we're going to be able to predict earthquakes anywhere, we're going to be able to predict them in Parkfield. And so they instrumented all of this work, uh, all of this place, and they made really specific predictions about earthquake, um, the timing of an earthquake, and the magnitude of that, or, that, or, um, of that event. And they argued there was a 90% probability that there would be a magnitude 5 to 6 between 1985 and 1993. And if they said, even if this doesn't work and you end up with an earthquake much later, you would expect that earthquake to be comparably bigger in a, in a predictable way. So here's the, the video, of course, of that earthquake. So um, this is in Parkfield, and this is a video camera, and you can see the shaking. And so finally, there was a, a chance to really test this Parkfield prediction and hypothesis. Um, and it was uh, uh, wrong. <laughs> uh, so the, the earthquake happened in 2004. So you remember the prediction was by 1993. And you know, remember we were saying that as more time passes, you're building up more elastic energy. And that you would expect a comparably larger earthquake because you've had more time to load that spring. And the earthquake was smaller. And so, you know, as is always the case, uh, when you fail, the, the solution is to then move the goalpost um, so that you can succeed in predicting earthquakes in a different setting. And so what we've done as a community is try to figure out places where we can say something predictive about earthquakes. Um, and one solution, of course, people have used um, is to just make your own earthquakes. So this is the time on the x-axis. On the y-axis, I'm showing the total number of earthquakes in the central US. And what you'll see is the number of earthquakes have spiked. And in fact, there are more earthquakes happening in Oklahoma today than they're happening in California, where there's a plate boundary. Uh, I'm not going to talk about earthquakes that are caused by people. I'm going to be talking today about naturally produced earthquakes that are predictive in time. And so here is an example of one of these, these events where we can say something predictive about whether earthquakes will form. So this is the, the Denali earthquake in yellow in Alaska. And in red, I'm showing all of the places where we saw an increased amount of seismicity in the days following that earthquake. And so you know, maybe that's not totally satisfying and that there's nothing predictive to say about this yellow point. But there is something predictive to say about the increased seismicity in, in these other settings. Um, and so you know, one of the overarching questions of how of this predictive seismic, uh, of trying to say something predictive um, about how one earthquake causes another earthquake is how do these seismic waves that are quite far away, how do, how do these changes that if you were standing there, you wouldn't feel anything, how do they produce many uh, hundreds of earthquakes? And I promise there won't be too many equations, but this is the Coulomb failure law, uh, where here we have shear stress is, proportion, is related to the friction, the normal stress. So friction is how tightly things are connected. The normal stress, which is how how much those surfaces are pressed together and the poor fluid pressure, which is how sort of lubricated that fault zone is. And people have proposed a whole series of mechanisms of how one earthquake can produce a bunch of other earthquakes. But those mechanisms, I think, can really be understood as sort of tuning and trying to find different ways to, to affect these different parameters here and to try to understand how a small change in Alaska can produce an earthquake in Mexico. Um, so, I want to start with this video. So this is a video of showing another phenomena. Um, this is a, a, a artesian spring. So that what you see in this water is this should be a perfectly still pool. There's no flow in or out. And what you see is these giant waves. And those waves are being generated by an earthquake 1,000 kilometers away. So in, a, in some ways, this is a, an analogous system to how we think about 
uh, how we should think about faults at depth and how they respond to these tiny stresses very far away. Is how does this, how does this um, pool of water know anything about an earthquake happening in southern Mexico? Or how does, how does this pool of water know anything about an earthquake happening in Alaska? Um, I should actually, j just as an interesting side note, there are whole communities of fish that live on the sloshing that they couldn't, that the, the biologic community couldn't be supported without this sort of bizarre hydrology. So the field site that I want to start by talking about this dynamic triggering. And so I'm going to start by talking about how earthquakes that are far away can produce large changes in a hydrologic system or in a fault system. And to do that, we went to a single well. So this is a map of California. It's you know, and we went to Eastern California in Long Valley Caldera. This is the caldera here. Um, and I'm going to show you a bunch of data from a well that's right here in blue and some data from a seismometer, which is in red, I think. Um, and the reason we went to this well is that it's a well that is in rocks that are similar to the rocks that we think are producing these earthquakes. It's a fractured crystalline rock, and we have really high resolution of the sampling rate. Uh, uh, it, we end up having resolution of about five seconds. And so that's high enough resolution that we can say something about the seismic waves. So here's a schematic cross section of that well. So here in the shallow, there's shallow sediment, there's a cased well, and it's inside of this, this uh, fractured uh, rhyolite flow. And so what, what happens is, you know, in, in some ways, this isn't exactly the way that we usually think of an aquifer. All of that fluid is being stored in fractures. And that the well is really only sensitive to the fluid flow along these fractures in this, uh, in this lava flow. So here's an example of some of the data. So here uh, I've plotted just a whole series of events, a uh, series of, of water level changes on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, I've centered all of these water level changes to the arrival of, of seismic waves. And what you'll notice is that when these these earthquakes arrive, and it doesn't really matter where they're from. These earthquakes are from very, very far away. If you imagine this, the, the, the pressures that are being produced by these earthquakes, it's often about the weight of a cup of coffee. So we're talking about very small pressure changes. And they produce these drops in water level in a well in California. Um, and that we see s roughly similar features. We see these drops in water level, these asymmetric flow out of the well. Uh, we see a recovery over a few um, hours. And we see this response to earthquakes all over the world. And this is a map. In red, I'm showing all of the earthquakes uh, that produce water level changes of greater than two centimeters. And what you'll see is they're all over the place. Uh, and in fact, in white, I'm showing some earthquakes that did not produce changes in water level, even though they're very similar in size and produce similar amounts of shaking at this well. So this is a sort of complicated graph. So I'm going to walk through it kind of slowly. So on the top, I'm, I'm going to show you some data from, the size, from a seismometer nearby. On the bottom in blue, I'm going to show you the water level changes. And we're going to walk through the seismic wave. Um, and this might be a review for some of you, but the first waves to arrive are these P waves, followed by the S wave. Here's a cartoon. And what you'll notice is even though there's a lot of interesting content in the frequency band of that, of that uh, of that seismic wave, there's no change in the water level. So what you should be seeing is nothing. Then the love waves actually produce the largest shaking. And again, you don't actually see any change in the water level, or you see almost no change in the water level. You don't see a large change in the velocity because I'm plotting the vertical component, and the love waves don't have a vertical component. But when we see the Rayleigh waves, these Rayleigh waves are surface waves that are moving along the surface. And the reason that we the surface wave, these surface waves end up being interesting is they cause dilation. They cause fractures to open and close, and that has a big effect on the hydrology. And similar to what you'd expect, or similar to uh, what I just said, right, that when the, this Rayleigh wave arrives, you see this asymmetric flow out of the well and this gradual recovery. And if you notice, so here's, the, here's again this seismic wave, and you'll notice that you see symmetrical behavior. You see opening and closing. And what we see in the well is we see mostly just draining. And so one, one question is, how, do, how is the well sensitive to these large changes? But their question is, why isn't it symmetrical? Why doesn't the water level perfectly mirror the seismogram? OK. Remember, I started the whole story as saying something about earthquakes. And so I, I want to I do that tie-in really quickly here. <laughs> 
So this is, again, that, that seismogram. So this is shaking that's observed at a seismometer. I'm going to zoom in just into this tiny little section of the seismogram. And what I've done is I've filtered, that, I've filtered that seismogram. So here in black, this is time, and this is velocity on the y-axis. And here I'm showing that shaking of that surface wave that we talked about. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you you can filter that seismogram to say something about earthquakes that are happening more locally. So here in this high frequency, in this very high frequency band, what we see is a series of, of peaks. And people have used peaks similar to this to identify what we call triggered earthquakes. So that's, that's really what we're talking about uh, when we talk about earthquakes that are caused by distant um, surface waves. Uh, maybe that's not super convincing. Uh, here, again, is the, is the seismic wave. And in red, I'm just plotting the cumulative number of these, these peaks. And what you'll see is that there's, there's all, there are very few of these. And then they build up and ramp up during the passage of these seismic waves. Unfortunately, all of these events are too small to locate. So it's actually quite hard to say whether they're earthquakes. But we can identify some earthquakes. So after the two earthquakes that caused the largest change in water level, the changes in water level that we observe, they're, they're several feet. We're talking, about, uh, we're talking about a meter to a meter and a half after the recent Ridge, Ridgecrest earthquake earlier this year. Yeah, Ridgecrest. Uh, in red, this is, a, again, a map of, the, of Long Valley caldera. Uh, in orange, I'm just highlighting the rim of that caldera. In red, I'm showing earthquakes that happened before the arrival of, uh, the, before the drop of water, the 12 hours before. And in yellow, I'm showing the 12 hours after. And what you'll notice is the location of these earthquakes doesn't really change all that much um, before and after the earthquake. Here on the y-axis, I'm showing the total number of earthquakes. On the x-axis, I'm showing time. And zero is when the when these seismic waves arrive. It's actually when the water level drops. And what you'll notice is that there's an increase in the total amount of seismicity. And so the, the surplus seismicity, this predictive, this predictive earth, uh, the, yeah, the predictive change that we can say something about is this sort of red shaded region. And this is for the two earthquakes that we had really high resolution data for. And, uh, uh, and we see similar changes after landers and many of the other earthquakes that we know cause these triggered events. So this is all sort of data. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, and so here we can plot, we can ask what aspect of these seismic waves produce changes in water level. And so on the y-axis, I'm showing here the water level drop in meters. And on the x-axis, I'm showing the, the peak ground velocity, so the amount of shaking um, that are experienced due to these surface waves. And these dots are showing, for diff are showing for different frequency. But broadly, what you should take from this is that if you shake the ground more, you get a larger drop in water level. Bro broadly, that's true. There are definitely some exceptions. And that, the, that there's a narrow frequency band that, that you only produce water level changes if you have large ground velocity in that Rayleigh wave section. So if you have most of your shaking and most of your energy concentrated um, at other frequencies, you don't produce these water level changes. So I'm going to propose a physical model to explain some of these changes and try to link back to how these earthquakes form. I'm going to walk through a very simplified version, and then I'll quickly show a comparison with real data. So the question is, how do these Rayleigh waves produce these asymmetric flow out of wells? And possibly, how do they produce asymmetric flow into faults? How do, you, how do, you produce, how do these uh, symmetric waves, where you go up and down, up and down, why do you, instead of seeing up and down in the well, and up and down within these faults, do we see this sort of gradual drop in water level or in gradual increase uh, in number of earthquakes. And to do that, I'm going to use the ideas of poor pressure diffusion, um, which actually, if you went to the talk on Wednesday, uh, this is very similar to math to what you use to look at diffusion rims along, along crystals, where the diffusivity so is proportional to the length and the time. Um, and what I'm going to be showing is I'm going to be showing two, the results of two ideas that we get from fracture mechanics. One is that the diffusivity increases during dilatation. And this maybe should make some intuitive sense. If you open a crack, it's easier for water and pressure to flow through that crack. Um, and the other idea is that you can amplify, that the size of a fracture can affect how, that, how the, the pressures amplify within that fracture. So this is similar to what we were looking at before. So on the top, I'm showing the seismic wave. 
This is just a, a, a cartoon version. Uh, on the top, I'm showing a seismic wave. Uh, in the middle, I'm showing the permeability. And on the bottom, I'm showing the water level. And here, again, is the schematic cartoon of our, of our well. And here's a fracture. And during the arrival of these dilatational waves, this is the Rayleigh wave, the fracture opens and the permeability of the surrounding rock increases. And so you get flow out, you get a peak in the permeability or the diffusivity, and you see, get flow out of the well towards that fracture. During the compressive portion of this wave, the, the fractures close, and it becomes harder for pressure to diffuse back from the fracture towards the well. And so over a series of earthquake cycles, you get this asymmetric flow out of the well and out of the aquifer and into these fractures. And then after, after the earthquake stops, you have a pressurized fracture and that pressure diffuses back through time. And you know, I should say that this model really has a lot of inf has been heavily influenced by work that some of, I, I think actually some of you have interacted with, as ideas about, the, uh, about economic geology and about uh, tensile cracks that form in rocks um, and this sort of fault valve model proposed by Sibson and others. But this is not something that we usually think occurs in the very shallow subsurface. Okay, so again, this is our sort of guiding, this is our, our guiding uh, scaling. And here on, I'm gonna show, so on the y-axis is the distance from the fault, on the x-axis is time. And so what this means is if you have some symmetrical shaking, in a simplified world, you get some shaking within this fracture, so this is our seismogram, and then that, that, that pressure within that fracture diffuses away. And so what happens is the amplitude decreases and the phase shifts. And so you know, this is showing just a series of seismograms. We can show this in color. But the point is, at different distances from the fault, you get this symmetrical uh, changes in pressure, and that pressure diffuses away from the fracture um, and so this is assuming a constant diffusivity or a constant permeability. Now, if you remember, we were saying that when you open fractures, you increase the ability of water and pressure to flow through that rock. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cause a very small change in that diffusivity during the passage of these seismic waves. And what you'll notice is you get this very extreme change in the overall flow and the overall pressure conditions within that rock. And the reason for that is you're getting, you're, the reason for that is during, these dilatational, um, during the dilatational wave, that pressure is not able to leave the fracture. And so you're producing asymmetric flow into the fracture, and you're producing draining in the overall system. And that you produce this gradual recovery after shaking ends. And so we can model a water level change um, where we produce asymmetric flow and a gradual recovery. And we can use actual data and say something about, you know, we can use actual data, we have a seismic wave, and we can say what is the water level change we'd expect given the physics that we know of dilating fractures and changing permeability at these very short time scales. And in green is the observation, and in blue is the model. Here's the seismic wave, you know, this is the boundary conditions. But, you know, I, I think the, the important part, right, uh, Earth is incredibly heterogeneous, but the point is that you can recreate many of these processes and a lot of this behavior uh, using this very simplified one-dimensional pore pressure diffusion model as long as you assume that, this, that the, the hydrologic properties are varying at really fast timescales. So this sort of wraps up the very first part of this talk. Um, and just to summarize, right, the earthquakes uh, that cause water level changes uh, also seem to trigger other earthquakes. And so what we did is we went to a well that seems similar to the, the conditions under which earthquakes might form. It's different by many kilometers, but, um, and we find that the peak ground velocity of these dilatational waves are what produce these water level changes, uh, and you know, m maybe are what produce these earthquakes. And we argue that there's some seismic pumping mechanism, that this is a way to produce asymmetric flow and sort of monotonically increase the pressure within a fracture. If we return to our sort of overarching initial questions, you know, how are seismic waves amplified in wells and in faults? Well, largely by this pressure dependence of hydrologic properties. And so as you have that pressure, as the hydrologic properties are changing through time, you produce asymmetric flow. And I'd suggest that similar processes are likely happening at seismogenic depths. Um, so this is the first, 
This is sort of the first part of this talk where we're thinking about how some earthquakes produce other earthquakes. So this is that, that photo that we started with, uh, where here's the Philippine Sea Plate and here's the Eurasian Plate. And the thing that's incredible about, about this site is the motion on this plate is modulated by seasons. That you get motion along this plate boundary during the rainy season and you don't get motion on the dry season. And so this leads to two related questions to what we were asking before is, you know, how do these hydrologic m loads, how does the, the changing water in eastern <coughs> Taiwan change the slip on the fault and the behavior of the fault? You know, this isn't as satisfying as predicting an earthquake because it's not an earthquake. It's a tiny little blip. Um, but it is something that's predictive. Uh, and how do these earthquakes, how do distant earthquakes change the behavior of this fault? So this is why you go to Taiwan. Uh, or this is one reason to go to Taiwan. Uh, this is a tectonic map <laughs> of Taiwan. Uh, just for context, nine centimeters per year of convergence is huge. That's twice what we get in California. So this is a uh, an incredibly complex sedimentary setting, a uh, complex tectonic setting uh, with really rapid um, convergence rate and really extreme and fast tectonics. So it's tectonically active. Here I'm, gonna show, here I'm showing a cross section, so A to A prime. This is the plate boundary, which I was showing in that photo. And what you'll see is a, a ch that there are changes in lithology between the two plates. And we're going to be looking at these seasonal changes along that plate boundary, which is accommodating about half this motion. And the reason we came here is partly because of this incredible tectonic activity. And the other reason it's incredibly densely monitored. Um, and that these different monitoring techniques and these different measurement techniques and geodetic techniques are sensitive to different temporal and spatial scales. So by having all of this data and looking at this really extreme setting, this is a good candidate of a, a place to go and say something about what uh, water flow inside of a fault is like. So just to give you a context, this is another photo of the plate boundary. Here's the Chishang Fault, um, a sign for the Chishang Fault. And so here's the Philippine Sea Plate, here's the Eurasian Plate, uh, which happens to also be a children's playground. And then this is the, this is the slide, which you can see is getting twisted during the aseismic, so the, the creep where you're not forming earthquakes, it's just constantly moving and you are constantly uh, making this slide more exciting. <laughs> uh, and then this is an example of a creep meter, which you can think about as sort of a, a spring. And so this is a way that we measure motion along this fault and motion that's twisting this, this slide. Okay, so I'm gonna, don't worry, there's a lot of data here. The point is that it's all similar. Okay, so on the x-axis is time, on the y-axis is displacement. In blue, I'm showing the precipitation and so you can see there's seasonal changes in precipitation. There's a rainy season and a dry season. In black, I'm showing the, the measurements from these creep meters. So those are those springs that are spread across the fault. Um, and what you'll see is that there's this seasonal motion along that creep meter. And maybe you're kind of skeptical by temperament and you think, well, you know, maybe the seasonality is just happening in that spring. Uh, you know, in the uh, spring is also a hydrologic thing. It's happening within that creep meter. Uh, and we see similar seasonality in GPS. This is work done by Meng Han in, on INSAR. Um, we see, so the, the deformation is definitely seasonal and it's seasonal all along this area. So I'm gonna really focus on first the seasonal question. So we see seasonally modulated displacement. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ignore this interesting earthquake signal. So here's the, the Chenggong earthquake. And so I'm gonna ignore this time when all the interesting earthquake stuff is happening. I'm just gonna ask, you know, if we subtract the background slip rate, what can we learn about the, the hydrologic properties of the fault by subtracting the background slip rate and looking at the modulation? So I'm looking at that black line and subtracting the red. And again, this is the equation that which, which we now know and love, um, where again, we have shear stress, friction, normal stress, and pore fluid pressure. And the two ways in which the hydrologic system uh, likely change the fault is one thought is people, people have is that you might be changing the normal stress. And the idea here is actually kind of simple. So here's a block model where we have our fault. And so we have the fault that wants to come up like this. You put a giant bunch of water after the monsoon uh, and it's gonna push the, the, the plate downward. And so maybe you would receive, maybe you'd have no slip during the rainy season just because of the weight of that water. So this is changing that normal stress here. 
And what you'd expect is that, so this is the, this sort of simple elastic loading model. And in black, I'm just showing a detrended slip on the fault. And so what you'd expect is an anti-correlation between the rainy season and the dry season, where you'd get slip during the dry season, and you're sort of loading the spring during the wet season. Unf unfortunately, of course, uh, the world isn't as, as simple as a, uh, as a uh, perfect uh, sort of 1D, uh, 1D load. And in fact, most of that loading is happening along the foot wall. Um, and so the idea here is, again, this is this block model. And if you're, this side wants to go down, this side wants to go up. And if you're putting your load on the side that wants to go down, then of course you're going to have a positive correlation between the time of the rainy season and the slip along that fault. And we can model this. So this is an example. Here's a 2D model that, that I did where uh, here I'm placing a water load. Uh, so this is based on the hydrology. We can say this is how much rain happens over, over the summer or, or during the rainy season. This is the fault. And we can model the stress that resolves on the fault. This is the shear stress uh, as a function of depth. And what you'll see is you get a fair bit of shear stress uh, actually a few kilometers down the fault. And so what that means um, is that, seas that the seasonal load would positively correlate uh, with that the, the deformation would positively correlate with the rainfall. And what you can do is that you can actually compare the model result uh, to GPS data. And I, I, I'd argue that it's broadly similar. Here on the y-axis, I'm showing displacement. On the x-axis, I'm showing the same distance we were talking about before. So this is distance from the center of the valley across the plate boundary. And these dots are actual data and are, are actual measurements of seasonal displacement from GPS. I'd argue they're broadly similar. The other, and one reason this is kind of discouraging <laughs> is that the, the signal that we observe assuming changes in pore pressure, which is similar to what we were talking about before. We have a fault, you put a bunch of water on top, that produces pressure inside the fault, and that's sort of lubricating the fault and promoting slip. And this similarly would produce slip uh, during the rainy season. And of course, there's a small phase lag. You might expect it takes some time for that water to penetrate into the fault. Um, but within the uncertainty of the hydrology and the, I, I would argue it's very difficult to disentangle these two processes. That these two lines look very similar. Okay. And again, we can model this similar to the modeling that we did in the first part of the talk. where We can impose the rainfall we observe and measure the stresses at different depths and ask what, what, uh, what slip would we expect given these pore pressures. Okay, so you know, initially when we looked at the, so we were, we we're saying it's actually very difficult to disentangle the result of the weight of water to the lubrication due to that water. And so it's actually very difficult to disentangle the seasonality. And I said that we we're gonna ignore this whole earthquake part. So now I'm gonna not ignore that earthquake part. Um, and I thought maybe this could be an interactive moment. Um, so you have the seasonal behavior, so we're gonna subtract the earthquake, ignore the earthquake, and what you have is seasonal motion along that fault. You have an earthquake, you produce a lot of slip, you're releasing all of, these, all of this elastic energy that's built up. What might you expect to the effect, uh, the seasonality to be after this earthquake? Maybe a student. Would you expect after an earthquake you're somehow more sensitive to season, to this seasonal hydrology? Or do you think you maybe would be less sensitive? Or maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe less yeah, right. So actually, I think the less sensitive argument makes a lot of sense, right? That you, you have the spring, you're loading the spring every year, and you have an earthquake that releases all that energy. Maybe you wouldn't expect any sensitivity to seasonality. And that's something that people have observed. So this is an example um, from 1988, where there was an earthquake in oh, 1961. And this is displacement. This is time. And what you'll notice is the, the fault just stopped moving after the earthquake. Then in some ways, you're, you don't have any energy stored along that shallow fault. Um, and so here, again, is this, this conceptual model where you have seasonality. You subtract out everything related to the earthquake. You'd get a flat line, maybe for a couple of years. The other sort of most pessimistic view, which thankfully none of you proposed, was that maybe this is actually unrelated to anything 
in the fault zone, and that maybe you'd see the same seasonality independent of any process that's happening within the fault. And the final possibility is that you are changing the hydrologic properties um, of the fault zone. So this is actually very similar to the first half of the talk, where we think about the, the, the hydrologic properties changing as a function of time. And the idea here is that you, during this earthquake, you increase the ability of poor fluid pressures to move through the fault. And there are, some th there are actually three very testable predictions about this. You expect an increase in the seasonal behavior on the fault. You would expect a decrease in the phase lag, that the pressures move more rapidly through the, earth, through the fault the year after the earthquake, and more slowly the year, uh, in, in following years. Uh, and you might expect an increase in the diffusivity or an increase in the permeability. And, there, and you know, so we, what we see is this. So again, I'm subtracting this background rate. There are a whole bunch of models that people use to, subtract after, to model afterslip. The point is it doesn't really matter what model you use. I'm just going to subtract all of this out and ask what is the change in seasonality after the earthquake. And it's almost, and you see a, a threefold increase in the seasonal slip after the earthquake. And you know, you might be like, well, you know, maybe it was a really wet year. It was actually one of the, it's the driest year on record. So the seasonal loads are very low this year. So how do you produce all of the seasonal slip? Well, this is similar to that, that hypothesis that we started with, that if you're changing the hydrologic properties of the fault, you're increasing the ability of that pore pressure to penetrate into the fault, so you're able to release more energy. So we predicted an increase in amplitude, which we see. It's hard to look at the lag, but this is showing lag in months. And what you'll see is the lowest lag um, in the, in, so this is the lag between a hydrologic load and slip on the fault, that the lag drops a fair bit. And that there are proxies that we can use to uh, say something maybe about uh, the hydrologic properties. So on the y-axis, I'm showing seismic velocity. On the x-axis, I'm showing time. And you'll see this change in seismic velocity after the earthquake. And people have argued that these changes in purple might be an indirect measurement of the changing permeability of the fault. You know, so uh, of course, we can make a quantitative model saying something where we can we can increase the permeability and we can recreate the pressures. So again, this is the data that you are now tired of, uh, where we have the seasonal motion that increases after the earthquake. Uh, and this is the poor pressure, pressure, this is poor pressure as a function of depth. And if we impose a change in permeability, we get much deeper penetration uh, of these pore pressures. And so you're able to liberate uh, elastic stress and elastic energy that's stored more deeply. Um, so just to finish up this portion of the talk, right, that, that we argue that even though it's very hard to tell in a normal case, you know, if we're just looking at that seasonal load, remember it was quite hard to tell the difference between the weight of the water and the pressure diffusion. Because we have this, because we have this earthquake, we can actually say that probably these seasonal changes are due to pressure within the fault. And that, that because that seasonality increases after the earthquake, that means that these pore pressures are able to diffuse more rapidly through the fault. And maybe that's suggesting something about how faults respond uh, both to hydrology and to other earthquakes. And if we return to these sort of motivating questions in the beginning, you know, how do hydrologic loads modulate slip? They probably modulate all sorts of ways. But in this setting, it seems like we see evidence for, for, for pore pressure diffusion. And how do these earthquakes trigger creep? Well, it seems like part of the story is this afterslip, which we subtracted away. But the other part of the story is that some of the slip is due to these changing hydrologic properties, that you can predict an, uh, an increased amount of slip due to the changing hydrology. And you know, in the very, very beginning, we started by asking, you know, how do we predict triggered slip on faults? And the first part, I was talking about how other earthquakes might, you know, trigger, how one earthquake might trigger another earthquake 1,000 kilometers away. I'm arguing that that's actually intimately related to the hydrology, that, that's by, that one earthquake causes a change in hydrology and causes flow at a small scale, even deep in the crust. And the second part of the talk, you know, we, we found that the seasonal creep is actually due to the surface hydrology. And that uh, and actually we, th we argue that the slip is propagating probably to a kilometer or a few kilometers depth. And that, there's a, that there are feedbacks between the hydrology and the groundwater and the slip and tectonics. Um, and with that, I want to acknowledge my co-authors on these two talks. Uh, the California, it was, the work done at Long Valley was done with uh, colleagues at the USGS. 
Um, this is Shaul Hurwitz, my old supervisor, and then my advisor, Michael Menga, uh, uh, Laura Clore, Tishwar Mittal. And the Taiwan work was also done with Michael Menga. Um, Meng Han and I did a lot of that field work. Uh, Jin Cheng Li was my supervisor there. And then Avinash Nayak and Roland Bergman, uh, who are both at Berkeley. And with that, uh, thank you so much. I'll take any questions. <laughs> Yeah. Cool. Yeah, someone lit it on fire though, so that's yes. that's not an actual. <laughs> 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 All right, Chris. Um, I guess my my first question is about the Taiwan project. Yeah. Um, so you have the model for the, for the second case, and you've shown that it has a uh, lead time of a few months. So could you just make predictions and further validate your model? Yeah. So it's a really good question. The, so I think that there's so there are. Just wait a few months. Yeah, so the, the issue is we have all these wells. So you're like, this is great. But there's so much heterogeneity even between the wells that the, le that the phase lag between the rainfall and the, the peak pressure in the well ends up varying by the same within those wells in that, uh, in that system. And you're like, well, maybe, maybe that fault is particularly permeable, right? Because you have fractures along this um, zone. Yeah. I, yeah, it'd be interesting to keep talking about this. I, I would argue that you can see it, but it's not as, it's not as intuitive as, as you might hope um, because of the heterogeneity, yeah. Yeah. For you guys, um, any questions from students? Yeah. Um, so after the earthquake, we have seen like, this large amplitude change, and then it sort of like goes back to normal. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm wondering, why is it not more of a permanent change if you're changing the hydraulic diffusivity? So it's a really good question. So something we observe, that this is a whole different can of worms, but uh, there, something that we observe uh, in all sorts of settings is usually the permeability and the hydraulic properties recover over some period of time. After the Wenchuan earthquake, we argue that people have argued that it recovers over decades. In some settings, they recover over, people have argued, hours. Um, what exactly is causing that rec recovery is not clear. Emily Brodsky at UC Santa Cruz has argued that there, what's ha what produces some of these changes is you imagine this, you imagine this network as, uh, you imagine it like traffic on the freeway and that you have like a lot of traffic and that's what's slowing down flow. And that maybe if you have this earthquake and you just knock all the cars out of the, out of the <laughs> way, then you can maybe increase flow for a little bit of time before traffic rec returns to its normal idea. And the idea is that they see little pores, little like blocks of, of sediment within the, within the pore space. And if you shake it, sometimes you can knock it out of the way and it slowly moves back and clogs the pores again. But I think, the, the, I think it's an open question of what drives that recovery in, in what settings. Yeah. Do you, do you see a, um, like a change in recovery rate in different areas because of like of, say different sediment in one area versus another different Yeah. Yeah. I also I did something. I, I did something a little. If you remember, are you asking about for the dyne, for the first part of the talk, or the California part, or the well, the Taiwan I'm part? I'm just saying, like in any in any. I guess if you compare California to somewhere else, do you have to make a correction for like the type of rock that is in that? Yeah, so it's, a, like it's a really good question. And the, just to, uh, and the answer is yes. That you can say something a priori, which is similar to what you were actually suggesting, is you can say something ahead of time based on what you know about the rock, about how it would respond. Something that I didn't point out is that, you know, I showed that, that map of dynamic triggering of how one earthquake produces other earthquakes. Uh, the settings where it produces other, they produce other earthquakes are almost always volcanic settings. And it's, I think, not well understood what, why that is. Um, you have increased loading rate, you have increased pore pressures, there are a whole bunch of things that might be. And the, uh, early on your talk, you showed a map of earthquakes distributed around the world that yeah. I believe you said caused level changes in the water in the well you were monitoring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And then, I thought that was startling. And then you had two and you Good. said there were no changes. Why? What were those two? What was the thinking? Yeah, I wish I knew. 
that, yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, the peak ground velocity, so the amount of deformation that we see in the well uh, is roughly the same between those, the, those white circles uh, and the red circles. So you're, you're like, well, that's kind of discouraging. There's a slightly different um, frequency component, and so it might be that there's, that if you filter for the surface waves, if you filter for the surface waves, maybe there's less energy in those Rayleigh waves than in the ones that produce water level changes. But even so, you might, I think you'd predict the water level change. So I, I don't know, it's a good question. Yeah, yeah, so that's a good point. And the, the other point, right, is that in the local interference, you can, you can have a, um, so we tried to look at the azimuth at which the, you know, maybe something about you get some fracturing or you get some, mo that the, these seismic waves are maybe moving along the east side of the fall, uh, east side of the caldera versus the, the west side. And maybe there's some difference there. It wasn't super obvious with the data. And we, we looked at about 300 earthquakes. So there, there's good, you'd think there'd be good statistics, but it's not obvious, yeah. Um, both Ernie and Heidi. Oh, Ernie first. Mm -hmm. Tag on to that. Is there any kind of natural frequency component that would eventually that pull those two out that they, that they're not hitting a certain? You said there's a little difference in frequency. Yeah, so maybe triggering. That gets you part of the way, but not all the way. Yeah, that's a good. Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. So you mentioned a little bit of effects for aftershocks. Are there any appreciable effects from foreshocks as well in these areas, or is that anything that's been explored as of yet? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, one thing I'd say is the distribution of aftershocks uh, and triggered earthquakes, dynamically triggered earthquakes, tend to follow a diffusion decay. It, if you squint. <laughs> uh, you know, I Amos Neuer and folks in the, the 70s went strong in the foreshocks producing dilatation, producing flow. Um, yeah, actually, maybe Wenlin has strong feelings about this, but I, I think the conclusion was that actually it, it's not super consistent with the, the data. Yeah. James, do you have a question? So I'm with, with the models with the Rayleigh waves, and I'm a geochemist, so yeah. I, I need an answer at that level. Um, I guess I, I'm trying to figure out what you you're creating space by creating dilation. And you see the dilation with the Rayleigh waves, but not with, with the other waves. Mm -hmm. And then with the other one, you're creating space somehow that allows for the pore fluid to get down. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, and so something has to go someplace. And then you made a comment. You said, the same, at the end of your talk, the same thing should apply as you go deeper. Yeah. How deep can you go? Do you think it will go? And is there something that limits how deep it will go related to where stuff. It's just a really good question. Uh, I, I, okay, so the, the first part of the, the answer to that is surface waves attenuate with depth. And so that you, there's, a, there's a diagnostic way in which those velocities get smaller as you get deeper. And Dave Hill, who uh, just passed away but was at USGS for a long time, uh, argues that you actually still produce fairly large pressure changes, dilatational pressure changes down to 5, 10 kilometers depth. Um, so, yeah. You know, the, 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 the spatial scale of the flow is very small, right? So the, the point is that, it's an, that you're looking at the surface for an analog process to what's happening at depth, not that you're producing flow that's traversing those, those 5 kilometers. Um, Drops, but then also the water table drop too, and then recover. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, it's not super straightforward what a water level means in just like a series of fractures. In, in, in some ways, it's pretty heterogeneous. I should say also the geochemistry changes after after these earthquakes. Um, we don't see it here, but in the in the second part of the talk, uh, Monk Han and I had gone after a few earthquakes, and we see changes in in the oxygen hydrogen ratios, which is suggesting mixing from of fluids that the that you get more mixing of fluids after these earthquakes. And so that's also consistent with the idea that you're fracturing this rock somehow and you're allowing fluids that were separate to mix. So, so I'll give a quick example that 
In 2014, there was a 6.0 earthquake in Napa Valley in California. And it was a long drought in California for a long time, but soon after the earthquake, there's water coming out in, uh, in the channel, in the river channel, like yeah. a meter or so. Stay there for a while. So there's evidence that water has to come from the mountains, and that's driven, ultimately driven by yeah, actually the, the history of the, these observations is really long. You can track Pliny the Elder in 79 CE uh, and he observes all this stuff. He has really crazy ideas about what's causing it, um, which we don't need to get into. But uh, yeah, but the, the observations are, are, have existed for a really long time and in all sorts of sedimentary settings, which gets to your, your geology question. Yeah. When you were modeling the observations and the devil's hold, you said yeah. that you had to assume that the, the hydrologic properties were varying on fast time scales. Um, could you say how, how fast of time scales? Well, I guess what I mean is the hydrologic property is varying during the seismic wave. Okay. And so you're talking about the diffusivity. The diffusivity, which is really I'm accounting for as a change in the permeability. Okay. Um, but the change that you need to produce the these effects is very, very small. So okay. just a factor of two okay, can produce to to. You know, really large changes. But you want to be a little careful when you use the diffusivity and permeability interchangeably exactly. because yeah. that's a hydraulic diffusivity also have the storage, right? It, and that is not mm. a very well constrained in yeah. any of the geology. Yeah, research. and it's tricky because there are settings where people see that increase in permeability that is perfectly balanced by a decrease, uh, that's perfectly balanced by a change in the specific storage. And actually the change in diffusivity ends up being zero in some settings. So uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, so why not uh, the effect of the uh, um, first The first, First, the degrees in the uh, uh, water level in the first part of the talk, you could have a, just that. So, you're talking about squeezing a sponge with water, right? So the pressure change, the, the water drop, water level change could come from uh, 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 So, this is a really good point. And actually, the first observation, uh, there were good observations uh, done very locally in Virginia, where by USGS in the 60s, where they'd, they found this karst well and the water levels go up by a meter and down by a meter during each of these waves. And you get these just crazy sloshing inside the well. But the, the thing that's actually really different from what we see is the seismic wave is symmetrical. And so the question isn't necessarily how do you get, you know, how do you get a change like this that, that mirroring that seismic wave. The question is, you know, why do you not go, why do you not go up as much as you're going down? And I think it's harder to do that just using poor elasticity. But I'd be, I'd be interested to chat more about it. Any yeah. more questions? Um, okay, if not, then we can move on to our geology launch.